We've seen victory celebrations get destructive in the past. Denver police say they learned lessons that kept last night's AV celebration calm. And am I imagining things, or did it feel like we all actually agreed on something in this city for a little while? Can we keep that up? With the Avs win last night, Marshall can now completely focus on politics again. And he's back to answering some of your biggest primary questions. Denver's real estate boom is creating a crunch for a creature of the night. This show's going to be a hoot. Or a scream. Grab yourself a Stanley Cup-sized beverage and see what happens next. There was a lot of talk about climbing light posts and turning the streets into a party if the Avalanche won the Stanley Cup. Well, the Avalanche won the Stanley Cup, and very little of that happened. Mark Salinger shows us that's no coincidence. You should have been there last night. The party in the streets was wild. So many people, fireworks, craziness to celebrate the Stanley Cup. Just look at this video. Oh, wait. That was just a couple hundred people on one street corner. It wasn't some sort of coincidence that the crowd in Lodo didn't grow to thousands of people climbing up light posts and setting cars on fire Sunday night. Denver Police Chief Paul Pazin says their plan worked. From a safety perspective, we'd have to say it was a, a win just like the Avs gave us last night. Police had roadblocks all around the city after the Avs won. Highway exits into downtown were closed, streets were blocked off, and SWAT teams surrounded the areas where fans did come to party. The goal? was to get people away from the city. Really the focus is on egress, getting people out of the, the greater downtown area in a safe manner. All the cars were directed one way, away from lower downtown. So on the way in, you have heavy vehicles coming in. On the way out, there's limited access uh, in order to help expedite getting tens and thousands of, of, of people from a highly concentrated area out where they, uh, they want to go. The only place people did gather in a big crowd was on 20th and Market in Lodo. Most of those people didn't come from the ball arena watch party, but the bars that let out. It helped that the bid watch party on the Tivoli Quad was canceled also. We were there to step in if anything happened, and we did. Uh, there were a couple of instances where folks lit some small fires within the crowds. Our officers escorted uh, the Denver Fire Department up to that location, extinguished the fire, and then walk back. After a Stanley Cup win, a lot of people expected some real trouble. Only one arrest. One arrest. Call that a win also. That one arrest was a guy who had some illegal fireworks. Now, Chief Pazin told me he had a call last week with the police chief in San Francisco about how they dealt with celebrations after the Golden State Warriors won the NBA championship. The police department in San Francisco says 17 officers were injured during celebrations after their city won the title. Denver was working to avoid what happened in California, and he asked for help to try and figure out how to do that. And it seems like it worked. So you had a little bit of that unorganized chaos, right, last night. They did a good job with that. What about the organized chaos coming up on Thursday with the parade? We'll see what happens, of course, but Chief Pazin says that that's a totally different animal preparing for something like that. It happens on a weekday morning. Uh, not everybody's drunk after a, a, a Sunday night Stanley Cup parties. So he says that they can prepare for it in a different way. They also just dealt with the parade with the Pride Parade, so it's not like they're doing this for the first time. Yeah, and we've handled parades here before, and they look pretty good. Absolutely. I'm excited. I'm pretty stoked, too. I know you we are. We both were pretty stoked last <laughs> night. Mark Salinger, thank you. Well, what we have witnessed in the last two weeks in this city is nothing short of remarkable. Set aside what happened on the ice. That's an incredible feat of its own. I'm talking about the burgundy and blue all over town. The people who would have usually passed each other silently at the grocery store who stopped and talked hockey. The light rail cars jammed full of people who wanted to squeeze into a crowd and be part of this moment. My cell phone wasn't working downtown because the network was so overwhelmed by the thousands of people who flocked there to be together. It would appear reports of downtown Denver's death have been greatly exaggerated. At a moment in our history when we're more divided than ever, hockey seems to have brought us together, at least for this moment. I hear some begrudge a bandwagon, but perhaps a bandwagon is just what we needed. The House Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection will have another hearing tomorrow. It was added to the schedule last minute. The committee says it will present recently obtained evidence. 
More hearings weren't expected until next month. Lawmakers spent the first several hearings detailing the key players behind the insurrection, including John Eastman, the former CU visiting professor who advised President Trump how to overturn the election. He later asked for a presidential pardon. Eastman is currently fighting the Justice Department's order to turn over documents, emails, and records related to January 6th. In a new court filing, he says, federal agents seized his phone last week and forced him to unlock it, gaining access to his emails. Eastman claims that seizure was improper. We are so close to not having to talk about the primary election anymore. Election night is tomorrow. You've had your ballots for three weeks now, and they need to be turned in by 7 p.m. tomorrow. Too late to mail them. you got to turn them in at the ballot box. And some of you still have questions. Lucky for us, politics guy Marshall Zellinger has answers. Our first next question comes from Sarah in Larimer County. Why are the ballot return envelopes different colors this year, purple versus the standard white? Let's hear and see the answer from Republican Larimer County Clerk Angela Myers. Well, in Larimer County, if you're an unaffiliated voter, you're going to receive a purple, a ballot that's got purple on the front. It's going to be white on the back, but purple on the front. And that's because we have to treat unaffiliated ballots differently as they come in. What's that mean to treat unaffiliated ballots differently? Since most unaffiliated voters are sent both a Democratic and Republican ballot, it's to alert election workers to be sure there is only one ballot returned inside the envelope. You cannot vote both. Unaffiliated voters are going to get two ballots. And when they come back, we need to make sure they didn't return both because they're only allowed to return one. In Jefferson County, the color coding is different. Democratic clerk George Stern explained that orange goes to Democratic voters and orange also goes to Republican voters. And black ballot envelopes are included for military and overseas voters because unlike our ballots, which need to be received by 7 p.m. tomorrow, military and overseas ballots in black envelopes can still count up to eight days after the election. We want to know when we receive it, oh, that's one that gets extra time. We don't need to set it aside in the rejected because it's not too late. Bob in Centennial wanted to know about his signature. Since voter signatures get verified before the ballot is removed from the envelope, Bob writes that his ballot envelope has his full name, but his normal signature is first name, middle initial, last name. Does it matter how I sign? Best advice we can give is to sign how you usually sign your name because we've got your whole signature history that we're able to look at from how you always sign your ballot envelope to how you're signing at the DMV. Sometimes it's with the hyphen, sometimes it's without the hyphen, sometimes they spell the hyphen. Steve, you better know the movie I'm referencing. What is the point of all of these questions that you're asking and the questions we're answering is so that we can get results tomorrow? I have my nifty little interactive map that we're going to play with again tomorrow night. This is what it looked like right now. This is you know, there's data in there from the last governor's race, the last Republican U.S. Senate race. Unfortunately, when I show current results, it's just going to white out the screen because we have no results until 7 p.m. tomorrow. I know that that's awful TV, so let's put it back on here. But this is going to be what we're going to break down by county. It's really going to be close probably for Heidi Ganahl and Greg Lopez, especially in their home county of Douglas County. Who's going to get that one? And if we go through the uh, data, uh, I'll do it tomorrow when we look at Greg Lopez, who finished third in the primary last year. He, he can do no worse than second this year because there's just two candidates. But we'll look at where he achieved some success last time versus now, and it'll help us know as we're getting closer toward can we call a race or not? This will help. I feel like a fool. What movie was it? Big. Big. It was big. I recognized it somehow, yeah. but it's good TV. You need to wear khakis if you're going to stand in front of a monitor. That's, that's, I think that's a, you have to do that if you're covering elections. Marshall Zollinger, thank you. Well, new campaign records show that Democrats are sparing no expense funding ads trying to handpick their opponent in November. We've talked about this ad a few times. It's about Republican gubernatorial candidate Greg Lopez calling him too conservative for Colorado. It is paid for by Democrats who want Republican voters to pick Lopez, thinking he'll be an easier candidate to beat in November. New campaign records released today show that the group behind that ad, Colorado Information Network, has now received one and a half million dollars from Strong Colorado for All. Strong Colorado for All got that large sum from the Democratic Governors Association in Washington, D.C., but originally forked over about 600 k for that ad. That was two weeks ago, meaning if you follow the train of the money since then, they've spent almost all $1.5 million on this one ad. 
This is the Democratic meddling that we've told you about. Democrats trying to influence the outcome of the Republican primary in an effort to help the candidate they think will be easier to beat in November. Well, Pride Weekend has wrapped up, but there's always an opportunity to support Colorado's LGBTQ plus community. We want to mention last week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign one more time today. Here's Kyle on the road during his time off with more. Thank you to everyone who's been supporting our latest Word of Thanks microgiving project to support the nonprofit Envision You. We featured them as Denver was celebrating Pride Fest because they're a statewide organization focused on the mental health of LGBTQ Coloradans. It's not easy, especially these days, to be an LGBTQ youth in our society. And they connect those of our neighbors with resources, and also they foster conversations between families, trying to find mutual acceptance and respect. It's important work, so thanks to everybody who's helped us raise $10,000 so far. The first two times I mentioned their work, there were abs games on TV. So I want to give you one more opportunity to support Envision You. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me in supporting the work of Envision You from Denver to Colorado's rural communities. It took 21 years, but the cup is back in Colorado, a very different looking Colorado. He's on a mission to save the barn owls one box at a time. They need a cavity to nest in, but they won't create it themselves. The owls aren't always super stoked about it, though. Next. Twenty-one years will bring about some change. Twenty-one years between Stanley Cup wins for the Avalanche that's no exception. The Avalanche won the cup at home on June 9th, 2001 in a very different looking Colorado. Back then, Ball Arena was Pepsi Center. In Power Field, Sports Authority Field, Broncos Stadium, Mile High Saga, that hadn't even started. 2001 was just the start of the Invesco Field era. In 2001, we were just a couple of years removed from back-to-back -back Broncos Super Bowl wins and about 15 years away from the next one. Colorado's population was closer to 4.3 million. As of 2020, it's pushed past 5.7 mil. And in the spirit of the primaries tomorrow, 2001 was the last time Colorado had a Republican governor. Republican Bill Owens was at the helm. Ice cream trucks may ride again in Aurora. It'll require an active city council, though. We told you back in April about the decades-old municipal code banning the sale of frozen dairy products, candy, or gum from a vehicle on the street in Aurora. You can't use music or bells and whistles to attract any attention either. Tonight, Aurora City Council will take up an agenda item to ditch that old rule, which apparently has been around since 1979. Everyone send Marshall Zellinger your favorite ice cream truck recommendations since he grew up in Aurora, apparently missed out on this crucial piece of childhood. I suggest the little thing with the, uh, the gumball eyeballs on the stick. You got to go for that. I'm not picky. I'll take it all, right? And what a perfect day, a warm summer day to have some ice cream. Certainly, we are also looking at some summer storms in and around the mountains through the foothills. This is our camera in Fort Collins looking off to the west, and you can see kind of those dark, daunting skies. Might find a couple of quick showers for us this afternoon through this evening. Otherwise, it's gorgeous across downtown Denver on a Monday evening, bright blue skies. But again, most of the action positioned up into the high country right there around the Continental Divide. You will notice a few isolated storms just barely starting to roll off the foothills potentially impacting the I-25 corridor. They'll bring us again a quick little round of rain, some gusty winds, a little bit of lightning, and then they're out of here. By about 11 o'clock, most of the action south of I-70. We'll be watching our skies clear overnight, and by early tomorrow morning, you're greeted to more sunshine. It should be a beautiful start to the day. Storms will be few and far between tomorrow afternoon. Again, most of those staying south of I-70. We'll start to see a little bit more action Wednesday, Thursday, and through Friday. Until then, this ridge of high pressure starts building in and that brings us the heat. We'll be back into the 90s for many folks here in eastern Colorado tomorrow. Good chance of storms Thursday, Friday and this takes us into the holiday weekend as temperatures uh, cool off just a hair into the 80s but we'll be hitting 90 on the 4th of July. Humans are making life difficult for Colorado's barn owls except for this human. This little guy is probably about three weeks old. 
He's trying to help. Next. When the Avs bring the Stanley Cup back to Colorado, please bring back Howler. It's been 20 years since Howler disappeared after maybe getting into a physical altercation with an opposing fan. 20 years is long enough. This is nothing against Bernie. He's all right, I guess. But Howler the Yeti was unique. Other pro sports teams have two mascots, like the Cleveland Browns. So the Avs could be the first good pro sports team with two mascots. Please, bring Howler home. Pay for the committee to make Kyle Clark wear the Howler costume for the Avs parade. There's something barn owls and people have in common. They like building homes in the same places. One man is working to make sure our state's booming population doesn't mean these owls no longer have a place to call their own. So if you look around, there's nothing but just big open fields. And this is ideal habitat because there's, there's not a lot of people out here. There's not a lot of cars. So today we have barn owls in this nest box. We're gonna extract the owls. Hi guys, my name is Scott Rashid. So I'm the director of the Colorado Avian Research and Rehabilitation Institute, or CARI. The reason I started the barn owl project is because the barn owl numbers have been declining over the years. They're declining due to loss of habitat, loss of nesting sites, disease and predation. I know, this is horrible being a little bird like this. They need a cavity to nest in, but they won't create it themselves. Oh, cute little guy. So I've created these large structures for the barn owls. So we're actually south of Platteville. Uh, we're uh, partnering with the uh, Oxton Oil Company. This is a, a property where we have some oil and gas development that we actually own the surface. There were a lot of derelict uh, turkey barns. And so as part of our due diligence there, we discovered a lot of barn owls living in them. And through that, we reached out to Colorado Parks and Wildlife and they set us up with, with Scott. I gonna get this little guy. He's a little scared. And we were able to not only take down those uh, turkey barns and restore that habitat, but also put in some alternative nesting sites. This is an adult barn owl that I banded actually as an adult. And she's in this box still. This is pretty exciting. And they are about as soft as they look. The goal of the project is to increase barn owl numbers because they're, they're declining so badly in Colorado because the habitat is being destroyed due to housing development. And so if I can help the owls by putting up nest boxes in great habitat for them, then the barn owls will start to grow and thrive and we'll have a decent barn owl population again. Scott says anywhere from 50 to 70 owls hatch in his boxes every year. He also has a similar program trying to save Colorado's American kestrel population. We're back with your feedback next. So this is a playoff beard. Should I shave it? I have a poll up on Twitter right now. 5545 say shave it. About 260 votes in. Seth writes in tonight to say the Avs don't want to admit the truth. They lost the Howler costume. There's a good chance. And this comment from John. My first memories of hockey were staying up into triple OT with my dad, watching the Avs and Red Wings back in the 90s. My dad passed away in 2011. It was an emotional moment last night. Wish he were here to celebrate this. He's celebrating with you, John. I think we're all celebrating. Cheers. Go Avs. We found a way. We'll see you next time.